There was once a pet store delivery truck going down the road. Every stoplight the driver came to, he'd run to the back of the truck, grab a two by four and start beating on the side of the truck. Nobody could figure out what he was doing, so finally somebody asked him, what are you doing? He said, oh, this is only a two ton truck and I'm carrying four tons of canaries. I've got to keep two tons of them in the air all the time. <laughs> For some of us, that's a picture of life. Many people are out there today beating themselves, trying to keep it all in the air so it doesn't come crashing down. We have a tendency to get stuck in life. I almost stuck in the garage this morning with the ice on it. I wondered if I was going to get out. We get stuck in relationships. We get stuck with habits. Uh, we get stuck in grief when we lose a loved one. Uh, we get stuck in anger. We get stuck in our work or maybe in a sexual relationship. And then we can't get out of it, and then you're hooked into a cycle. Once you're stuck, then you start feeling guilty that you're stuck. You say, well, I wish I could get out of this, but I can't. Then you have a lot of guilt after you can't get out of it, you can't change. Then comes anger, and you say, I should be able to change, and you get angry at yourself. And your anger turns to fear that I'm never going to get out of this. It's got control of me. I'm going to end up in the hospital. And your fear eventually turns to depression. You start feeling sorry for yourself and have a, a pity party. And you resign saying, I give up. I can't change. And you start the cycle all over again and get further stuck. How do you break out of that stuckness? That's what we've been talking about for a couple of weeks. Step one, admit it, I've got a problem. Reality step. R for realize I'm not God. Step two, hope step. Uh, not only am I powerless, but God has power and he's willing to help out. Okay, so we're going through recovery. Remember those eight letters? Realize I'm not God. Step two, hope step. Not only am I powerless, but God has power and he's willing to help out. He knows my problems and cares about my problems and cares about me. He knows everything going on in my life. He's offering to help me change. And that's the hope step. And our E in recovery for earnestly believe that God exists and has the power to change me. But it's not enough to just know that God will help you. You have to take action. You've got to make a decision. You've got to walk across the line. Step three, letter C in recovery, is consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. We read that together. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. This step's based on what Jesus said in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, overburdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to me. God's invitation. I'll lighten your load. You'll have relief. You'll have release. You'll have rest. You'll have rejuvenation. Give me control and care of your life. Watch what I do. I'll give rest. The Greek word means to cause or permit one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. To give rest. Refresh. Reminds me of Peter's preaching not long after Pentecost in Acts 3.19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. What a deal. Why would anybody turn that deal down? Yet perhaps some of you have heard this before yet you've never acted on it. It's like having an unopened gift. God says, I want to give you this gift of relief and release and recovery, and yet you've done nothing about it. What keeps us from taking this third step, this important step? What causes me to procrastinate giving my problems to God, to delay surrendering my life to the care and control of Christ? Well, what will keep us from doing that? Five things here. First, pride will keep me from admitting I need help. Proverbs 18, 12. 
arrogant people are on the way to ruin because they won't admit it when they need help. Okay, guys, how many of us men find it hard to stop and ask directions? <laughs> Arrogance. You, you hate to admit you need help. Proverbs 10, 8. A self-sufficient fool falls flat on his face. Maybe you're not ready to take this step. Maybe you're not ready to say, I give control and care of my life to Christ. I'm not ready yet to do that. All you need is a, a greater dose of pain. God will gladly allow it to get your attention. Second, guilt will keep you from taking this step. I may be ashamed to ask God to help me. Psalm 40, verse 13. For troubles without number surround me. My, my sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. Or the, the Living Bible translation. Problems far too big for me to solve are piled higher than my head. Meanwhile, my sins too many to count have all caught up with me and I'm ashamed to look up. Blinded, obscured by the mess, even ashamed to look up. I don't want to ask God for help. How many times have we asked God for help and made a promise and then broken the promise? God, if you, if you just get me out of this, perhaps you're embarrassed to ask God for help. Guilt and shame are holding you back. You say, you don't know all the things I've done wrong. I couldn't go to God and ask for help. You're wrong. Dead wrong. There's no sin that God cannot forgive, except that of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is probably not yours. God wants to help you. Don't let pride or guilt keep you from taking this step. He wants to forgive your guilt. Since I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, repent, turn to me. Third, fear. I'm afraid of what I might have to give up. What are you afraid of if you commit your life to Christ? What are you afraid will, will happen if you give God care and control of your life? What, the, you'll turn into a priest or none? Maybe you'll be the next pope. You say, I don't want anybody controlling me. Who are you kidding? You're being controlled all the time. It's just that you choose who you're being controlled by when you let God control your life. Otherwise, whether you realize it or not, you wind up being controlled by the enemy, the prince of this world. Sin enslaves. Those three foes, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they've got their hooks in you. You're controlled by the opinions of other people. You're controlled by hurts you can't forget. You're controlled by habits, hang-ups, but the imperfect way your parents brought you up and the, the inbred response patterns you saw them use. Do you know what freedom is? Freedom is choosing who controls you. When you give your life into the care and control of Christ, he sets you free. He said in John 8, Those who sin are slaves to sin, but if you hold my teaching and are my disciples, you will know the truth. And the truth will what? Set you free. You hear that? Jesus says, I set you free. Folk icon Bob Dylan saying, You're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody going to have to serve somebody, even if it's your own ego. Real freedom is choosing who your master will be. So what are you afraid of? What are you holding on to to think, oh, I can't let go of this in order to give my life to God? A relationship, an ambition, a habit, a lifestyle, possession. Jesus challenges that. Mark 8, 38, he says, how does a man benefit if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the process? Is anything worth more than a person's soul? Your, your very core? No. You take this third step. You give up everything and then you never had it so good. Because he takes what you've given him. He turns it around. He adds new meaning, new significance, new vitality. Gives it back to you in a whole new way. If you've been afraid to yield your life to the care and control of Christ, you may be fearing that he might make you some fanatic, some nut that you might have to give up. Fill in the blank. Don't worry about the specifics of what you might have to give up. If you, if you focus on the specifics, you'll never make the greater decision, which is <coughs> the step to recovery. Just come to God and say, God, I, I don't even know what I want to give up. 
I do know I want my life to be under your control. So God, here's a blank check. And, and give God a blank check. Here's my life. Let him take care of the rest. Don't be afraid. Or if worry can keep you from surrendering your life to the care and control of Christ. We confuse the decision-making phase with the problem-solving phase. Back in 1963, when JFK announced publicly, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, that was the decision. Had all the problems been solved when he made that decision? No. If you're a good manager, you know you never confuse decision-making with problem-solving. You confuse them, you'll never make the decision. You, you have to make the decision and then solve the problems. Kennedy said, we're going to the moon. Then it was NASA's problem to figure out how to make it work. You make the decision and then you solve the problems. If you wait for all the stoplights to turn green first, you'll never go anywhere. You can't solve all the problems first. You make the decision. So, I open my life to the care and control of Christ. I've got doubts, questions, fears, worries. I don't know how it's all going to work out. But I know it's the right thing to do. So I just do it. Some 40 years ago, I myself took this third step and said yes to Jesus Christ. It was part of a, a young people's weekend in St. Mary's. We had this singing band called Hakamu come from up around the Barry area. Just saw this joy on their face and their you know, enjoying the relationship with Jesus. So I said, I don't understand it all, but Jesus, if you're real, come into my life I'm empty and alone. And I want the joy I see on the faces of your people. So I open my life to the care and control of Christ. Even today, many years later, I'm still sending out changes of address saying, no, I don't do that anymore. That's, the, that's not the new me, that's the old me. I'm still making changes of address. Don't let worry bother you and keep you from making the decision. The Christian life is a decision followed by a process. Same with recovery. It's a decision followed by a process. All I'm talking about today is the decision. Okay, let's do it. Let's go for it. In church, we have a process called discipleship. That takes time. Worship, Bible study, small group interaction, maybe some mentoring one-on-one. -on -one. It helps you become all God wants you to be. What we're talking about today is just the first step. When you make this step, what's happening is God gets a beachhead in your life. Like when the military establishes a, a beachhead prior to capturing the whole island. The Bible calls it conversion or being born again. It just means God gets a presence in my life. Does that mean everything in my life is perfect? Absolutely not. It means God's in your life. He's got a beachhead and the rest of your life he's going to be setting you free little by little by little. It's a process. So don't worry about it. Just trust God. Maybe you worry that in this battle you couldn't hold on and hold up. God says, don't worry. It's not your job to keep it. I do the keeping. Psalm 121. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Speaking of his sheep, Jesus promises, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Peter urges, cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. So God's saying, I care for you. I hold you in my hand. A loving parent when crossing the street with young children will hold their hands and keep holding on even if they struggle a bit and try to wriggle free. The, the parent keeps holding on to protect and guard the young child. God holds. Whatever God asks you to do, he'll enable you to do Philippians 1.6, uh, correction to bullet points, got 1.8 there, it's actually 1 verse 6. God who began a good work in you will keep right on helping you to grow in his grace until his task is finally completed. And the fifth thing that can keep us from making a step is doubt. I want to believe, but my faith just seems so small. You need to recall the man who brought his son for healing to Jesus in Mark 9. His, his son suffered from a seizure demon that would sometimes throw the boy into fire or water. 
They asked Jesus to help them if you can do anything. Jesus retorted, if you can, everything is possible for him who believes. The man got honest with the Lord and exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And Jesus cast out the seizure spirit. Maybe you need to say like that, fellow. God, I want to believe that you will help me with my life. Help me with my unbelief. That's good enough. Have you been supposing a person has to have a big faith? Look at what the Bible says. If you have faith as small as what? Mustard, Mustard seed. Nothing will be impossible for you. It's not the size of your faith that matters. It's the size of what you put it in. The size of your God. You can have giant faith, but put it in the wrong thing and get no results. Some people put their faith in their horoscope, but it's the wrong thing to put their faith in. Faith is not the issue. The issue is what you put it in. A little faith in a big God gets big results. Uh, so I've just been reading through the Bible in the uh, planner book, and this past week we were reading about Gideon, and think about Gideon and all his not just the fleeces, but there is the, or just, just wait here while I go and bring a meal for you. And the angel patiently waits and he goes and gets the goat and the bread and puts it on the rock and poof. Oh, that's not enough. Uh, Lord, I, if I take this fleece, I, I want you to make it dry and all the ground around be wet. And, and oh, that's not quite enough. Lord, if I take this fleece, I want you to make it wet and all the ground around be dry. And, and, and by the time they get to the actual battle, God say, Okay, Gideon, I know you pretty well. Uh, let's go down to the enemy camp, and you overhear this dream that the enemy's dreaming about. And then, you know, so God's very patient with Gideon with his little faith. Don't let any of these things keep you from taking this step. Well, how do I take this step? What's it mean to take this step? First, I accept God's Son as my Savior. I need to be saved. I need help. I realize I need him in my life. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, Paul and Silas told the anxious jailer at Philippi. What does this mean? It means committing as much of myself as I understand at this moment to as much of Christ as I understand at this moment. Is that good enough? That's good enough. Second, I accept God's word as my standard for living. Ever notice the equipment runs a lot better when you follow the instructions in the manual? From now on, I've got a manual that I'm going to live my life by. Some graffiti on a wall offered this opinion. It said, this life is a test. It's only a test. Had it been an actual life, you would have been given an instruction manual to tell you what to do and where to go. What that graffiti artist didn't know or maybe acknowledge was that fortunately, we do have an instruction manual. It's the Bible. Jesus, God's word incarnate, held up scripture. God's word written as infallible. He said, can't be broken, John 10, 35. And authoritative. He said, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything's accomplished. Our chief warning, more convincing than even than someone rising from the dead, Luke 16, 31. Jesus said, this, this is life-giving. The person who has my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. God says, this is your standard by which you evaluate life around you. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The Bible is your yardstick, the manufacturer's handbook. Accept it as your standard. Third, I accept God's will as my strategy, as my goal in life. John, what do you want me to do? The first question I always ask is, Lord, you woke me up this morning. It obviously means you have another day for me, a purpose for my life. What do you want me to do with it? As David says, I delight to do your will. I seek first God's will. God, I'm willing to do anything, anywhere, anytime. I, I don't even have to understand it, but I'm living my life on your terms because you made me for a reason. You have a purpose, and I want to fulfill that purpose that you made me for. And so God's will becomes my strategy for life, whether I understand it or not. 
for I accept God's power as my strength. Philippians 4.13, great verse to memorize. I can do what? All all things. I can do all things, everything through Christ who gives me strength. No longer do I have to rely on my own energy. Things work better when they're plugged in. You get plugged into God. You don't have to be so tired all the time. You can tap into his refreshing and strength. Knowing God gives gumption. God says, I'll give you my power to be all I want you to be. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and we'll dine with him. Have fellowship with him. I just talk about grabbing a donut at the drive-thru window at a Tim Hortons, but more like spending a good chunk of the evening at a Chinese buffet. He wants to spend that time with you. Jesus says, I'm standing at the door of your life. I'm knocking and I'm saying I want to come into your life, but he's a gentleman. He will not beat the door down. Step three means open the door. The key that unlocks the door is willingness. You can define it this way. Willpower is willingness to accept God's power. You don't need willpower. You need willingness to accept God's power in your life. Go by his controls, his system. I'm just going to end today with a a four-minute video by Richard Ellis. He's a a pastor in Dallas, but I think you can relate to some of the, the struggles that he went through and how God helped make it clear what he was inviting them to in this relationship, how to connect his story and his life with the story of Jesus. Maybe you're where Richard was there and you're ready to take that step. You suddenly see how it all connects. And you say, trust God as you make that decision and, and walk with him through the door. Maybe you're where Claude is. Maybe you know somebody that's uh, struggling and you can come alongside warts and no hair and all or whatever you can just as you are and be a simple person that helps them to, to join the dots to see their story in light of God's story God being there for you let's pray